testing, test, test, test. There we go. I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to be with us here tonight and get through his, uh, get through the word of the Lord, but also in our last chapter of the, the book we're going through, I am a church member. So uh, let's pray together right now. Jesus, Lord, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to be together in your name here tonight. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for everyone that is here. God, grant us uh, understanding through your word tonight. Uh, grant us wisdom, Lord. But God, beyond that, let us uh, apply what your word is teaching us and has taught us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody say amen. Amen. Why don't you turn around and say hi to somebody if you haven't already. And uh, say hello to somebody in the name of Jesus. And you can be seated. It's good to have Sister Sharon Wilson with us tonight. And some of you have know her, and i um, so thankful to have her worshiping uh, with us tonight and in the time of uh, midweek Bible study. Amen. The youth will be hanging out in here tonight, and um, this is a, an important lesson tonight. Uh, we have go we've been going through, how many has read the book? I mean, just, has anybody had to take time to read the book yet? Um, would you say that you've enjoyed the book, those of you read the book? Um, you've enjoyed it. Hope you... Uh, uh, don't read it too quickly, but read it with an open heart and read it with a, a heart that you want to understand and to apply the things that are in this book. I am. A, everybody say, I am a church member. Look to your neighbor and say, you are a church member. And we all are members of the church. So we're going to be looking at chapter number six tonight and um, looking forward uh, to this. Um, this is an incredible, incredible chapter, and I hope I can teach it as well as it, has, it was instructed in the uh, book tonight. I hope you have your Bible. If you don't have a Bible, uh, grab one. Uh, you don't have to grab two. One's enough, but you can grab one. And um, does everybody have a Bible or a phone or something like that? You can, you can, you can read. Uh, that would be awesome. Um, Evan, once you go down to my office, there are two Bibles on my desk, and um, we'll make sure we can hand couple Bibles out to anybody that does not have one. Everybody, want everybody to have a, a word of the Lord with them because I, I, there's some scriptures in this in this study tonight that I think that um, not only hearing them is good, but reading them for yourself and opening up your Bible and turning it to them. Um, I was a big proponent a few years ago of reading the Bible on my iPad or my phone, and I love that when it's convenient, but there's nothing like turning the pages of your Bible, and I am a firm believer in having a personal relationship with God, but also a relationship with His Word, and specifically, have a relationship with your Bible. Um, there's some Bibles that I read, and I love them for reference, but I love the Bible I have right here because I've built a relationship with it, and it has my writing in it, it has my highlights in it, and um, when I read a scripture and I read what I wrote, it could be several years ago, it still speaks to me. It's like I'm talking to myself, and I can take me back. So I love having a relationship with, with my Bible. So we're going to talk about uh, treasuring uh, membership as a gift. Everybody, it's a, everybody say it's a gift. Um, yeah, Colin and James need a, need a Bible. Anybody else need a Bible? There's a Thompson chain for you. There's an ESV archaeology Bible. Anybody else? Anybody else need one? You got it? Okay. Um, it's We got to understand tonight that membership, and we've talked about what membership is in the previous weeks, and I want to say thank you to Brother Calhoun. Did a great job last week teaching and um, uh, did, a, did a wonderful job. So uh, we talked about how to pray for leadership and the ministry of the church and lift them up as a part of being a church member. But chapter number six, we're going to talk about how we can treasure, um, how we should treasure the church membership as a gift. So imagine a child facing two scenarios. Everybody say two. If you've read the book, you'll understand this story first. Uh, the first scenario is mom tells little Johnny to clean his room, but when he cleans his room, it's got to be perfect. It, there cannot be any dust. There cannot be anything out of place. It has to be absolutely <clears throat> perfect. In fact, it's got to be spotless and cleaner than 
he has ever cleaned before. It's got to be immaculate. Now, how many has ever had to clean your room and your mom and dad say, make it spotless? You know, thank you, James. James raised his hand. And um, many of you are perhaps past that stage of a parent telling you how to clean your room. But you can remember those conversations you had of the pressure to clean your room to your mom and dad's expectations. So what do we do? We hide things under the bed. We push things in the closet and force the closet closed. And then the next person that opens the closet, the closet door swings out faster than it should because we've crammed things in the, in the closet and put things uh, so we try to make it look like we've cleaned well. But in this scenario, Johnny was to clean his room to a place of being spotless and to clean in places perhaps he could never clean before. And um, he needed to, uh, uh, be per it needed to be perfect whether he liked it or not. Okay, that's scenario number one. Scenario number two is someone tells Johnny or the mother tells Johnny he has been given an incredible gift. Unlike any gift he has ever received before. This already sounds amazing. It's a gift that it will cause countless hours of joy. It will have countless hours of love. You will get such a great reward out of this, uh, out of this gift. And it's almost like it's a gift that keeps on giving. How many would that sounds good? A gift that keeps on giving. That can be a bad thing too. You know, somebody give you something, a gift that keeps on giving. Um, uh, so it's, it's a gift that is, is, is countless hours of joy and love. So which one do you think Johnny would choose? Anybody? Which one would Johnny choose? The one that brings countless hours of love or, or the scenario where he had to clean his room and to make sure it's spotless? I know many of us, especially my kids, would pick the spotless room. No, they would not pick the spotless room. Um, they would not pick that. But every church member, even in this room and those who are watching online, we all face this same, these, these same scenarios when the choice is really just as obvious. The first option is much like church membership, similar to what we have called a church country club. Everybody say country club. The first option is much like church membership as a country club. We, we join to see what we can get out of it. When I have seen many people, um, and this is a no reflection to any one person or any one thing, but over my time of, 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 of pastoring and over my time of being a part of church, people will come, and I have done it myself, to inspect before I go and commit to a church, what is this church going to provide for me? Right. What is this church going to what am I going to get out of this church? Um, I, I've heard people that come to visit churches and um, and I've had these conversations about myself and about our family. And, and God just kind of shows me what's what's right and what's wrong. But many people will go to a church and says, OK, what can you provide for my kids? What is this church going to provide for my family? Do they have classes for my kids? Do they, does the church have the right size youth group for my family? Does, what is the kind of things they do for the, the moms and dads? Do you, do you have anything for, for dads or do you have anything for men in the church? Because if you do, that's the kind of church I want to go to. So we measure when you even go to visit a church, what does that church, what can that church do for you? That's that first option. We join to see what we can get out of it. Another part is the pastor is to feed us in his sermons. We expect the pastor to give us what we need in, in his sermons. In fact, we will specify an acceptable range for the length of his sermons as well. What is the appropriate time period in which the pastor should preach? Now, I've heard people um, say that 20 minutes is enough and, and uh, 45 minutes is enough. And I've had people say, we want to hear more of the word and, and I always, uh, I, I understand that if I teach or preach for a long period of time, I start feeling a spirit come over some folks. If that's you, then that's you. I don't know. So we, we basically go to house of God and we, in, in our subconscious, it gets into us and say, well, I, I really have things to do. So I hope he doesn't preach a long time tonight. 
I hope that, that, that the music doesn't go so long. Right? I, I really hope that they don't sing that song 40 times like they did the week before. We have a specified, acceptable things of what we get out of church. That's what we do. That's the, the people that, that, that have an ex acceptable range of what's good for them. The music is to fit our style exactly. And if it doesn't fit our style exactly, then, then we will hold back our worship or we're confused or even the how to worship. And any deviations uh, are not acceptable when it comes to music. And we share our, our displeasure with others of, of, of the music's not right, the preaching's not right, it's not as long, it's, and we compare it to this, we compare it to that. And now I've allowed your mind to do those things now that we're talking about this. We, we look at church as programs, and will these programs benefit me? How does that fulfill me? How, that This program doesn't fit for me. I cannot be involved in that. Well, the schedule of the services, the schedule of this doesn't fit my agenda. So, so what am I going to get out of this? Pastor, the ministries that are going on here, they, they, they just don't seem to fit my style. They don't fit, seem to fit my agenda. They don't fit my, my lifestyle. So what benefit am I going to get out of that? Many people have this view of the church. We determine what we like and what we don't like. Amen? Let's be ourselves. How many's ever been there? We do. We are members who expect perks and privileges and service. That's what the first road of expectation or scenario shows us. So when a country club member is asked to contribute, what happens? What happens when a country club member is asked to serve in the nursery for a few weeks or to serve in cleaning up the church for a few weeks? Or will you take care of the outside and clean the windows for a few services? Will you will you do this? Can you clean this? Can you do this? Can you can you teach a Sunday school class for a few weeks? Well, the response is pretty predictable when people ask those type of members to do something. The country club member may agree to a request out of obligation somebody say obligation because after all you were asked by the pastor to do this so you were you will respond by saying yes out of obligation but this person has a legalistic approach to serving it's not that she wants to do it it's not that you want to do it or he wants to do it because as a country club member it's not about working it's about it's it it, it, it can't be about working uh, or it's not about working, it's about being served. Because when you go to church and you put expectations and measurements and everything that goes on, you have the spirit of, uh, the, of expectations of what the church can do for you. Because it's not about working, it's about being served in the kingdom. How can the church serve me? What can God do for me? Many people pray that prayer. They jump right to what God, what they expect God to do for them. Amen. You go to prayer and say, oh, God, if you could just do this for me. Oh, God, if you can do that for me. But the Bible says, enter into his gates with and into his courts with praise. And be thankful unto him and bless what? His name. For the Lord, he is good. You hear what I'm saying? Say, so as a member of the body of Christ, we are to be a blessing to the kingdom. I wish somebody say amen right there. We are to be a blessing unto the kingdom. But as a country club member, as one that wants to be served and wants everything to be about them, it's about, it is about being served. So, uh, but since they've been asked, they begrudgingly accept the the, the task at hand and the ministry. But what happens with this, because no, they're no longer being served, they're being asked to, to do something. There is something that happens in that spirit. The spirit starts, that the, they're, they're serving within that ministry, it starts with a bad attitude already. So what happens is they will not stick with that very long. It will end very quickly. Because they have the attitude 
of being served rather than serving. And it's, and it's so true. Other country club members get mad when asked. They're not just upset. They get mad. Well, so-and-so hasn't done this. I think one of the hardest tasks to do is find the schedule for the nursery. How many find that to be true? How many has ever been asked to be a part of the nursery, and all of a sudden something wells up in you? You're asking me? <laughs> Don't you understand? But that's, and, and, and that's almost natural for us because sometimes we, we feel like we will miss out on other things, so there is a sense of loss. But in reality, there is a gain to the kingdom if you just, we can just serve. And I'm not going to have a sign-up sheet for nursery tonight. Don't get me wrong. I don't, I'm not going to do that. Others say they have had their time in earlier years, so that's already passed me by. So to some, ministry becomes a prison sentence. Well, I know if I get stuck in that Sunday school class, and then nobody else will ever step up, and I'm stuck here all by myself. Y'all smiling and shaking your head because you know that's the case. If I say yes to the nursery, and then I'll be pegged as a nursery teacher for six months. Or if I, if I say yes to greeting on Sunday, and then I just know that I'll be stuck at that front door every service. So all of a sudden we begrudgingly get pushed into something, and then we feel like we are a prisoner of that thing. Others says that, what, what, well, that's what the pastor's paid for. Pastors are just lazy, and they, they should be taking care of certain things around the church. They're just trying to get out of work. And you think, that's in the book, but you think that's not being said? That has been said. Well, that pastor should be doing that. He's full time. That should be, why doesn't he clean the church? Why didn't he do this? I do my part. You know, so because we, we don't want to get caught up. That's a country club membership kind of a feel that, that, well, somebody else will take care of it. Somebody else will do it. And, 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 and people are just trying to get out of work, and, and I don't want to be caught up in this and caught up in that. And that's the spirit or the attitude of that country club member or that, that first person that everything's got to be perfect just for them. But there is a second option to church membership. And I would like to call it the biblical option that the book says that sees membership as a gift. Somebody say it's a gift. And I have never really since reading this book really um, understood it in this fashion. And I've always understood it this way, but really the way to go through scripture here is very powerful. There is a biblical option on how to look at membership in the church and in the body of Christ. It is something that should be treasured. An opportunity to serve rather than a legalistic view in which we described a few moments ago. There is a biblical perspective of the gift of church membership. Let's go to Romans chapter number 3. If, it's, if you have your book, it's in the book, but I want you to open your Bible. Go to Romans chapter number 3, verse 23. It's a very powerful verse of Scripture. Romans 3, 23. I'm sorry, my voice is, I pray that I can get through tonight. Got some sinus stuff going on. I'm not contagious. I washed my hands before I walked in the sanctuary. We're good to go. Romans 3.23 says, for all have, that means you. That means the person, the person sitting next to you. And we have come what? Short. Just because you're under five foot, that's not what it's talking about. Now, if you're under six, that means you're short that way. But we've all come short. We've all fallen short, Sister Bonnie. We've all come short. How many is perfect in this room? Raise your hand. I'll put my hand down. We're not perfect in this room. We, for all of us, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says, if we go to Romans 6.23, just a few chapters later, that since we've all fallen short and we all have sin in our life, or had sin in our life, the Bible says in Romans 6.23 that everyone deserves something because of their sin. For the wages of sin is, but the, what? The gift of God. Are you thankful for the gift of God? 
The gift of God is eternal life through what? Jesus Christ. You need to highlight that in your Bible. Put that in, script it in your mind just a little bit. It is a gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I love the last word of that. It's, it seems like the Bible just throws in the Lord right there. I'm thankful that I understand the power of the cross. But guess what? I need a Lord in my life. Jesus is a lot of things to us, but I need a Lord. So let me read that again. For the wages of sin is death. In other words, if you have sinned, if you have done something wrong, there, the wages of that sin is death. But there is a gift from God. He becomes the advocate. Amen. He begins, and I'll get this to it in a minute. Maybe he comes, becomes our substitute. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Jesus is our substitute. He took the punishment for me on the cross. Are you thankful for that? So let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse number 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin. He did not have to come to this world, y'all. He did not have to robe himself in flesh, talking about God. He didn't have to robe himself in flesh. He did not have to go to that cross for you. But he loves you. I said he loves you. Do I have an amen in this room? He loves you. Something very powerful. Uh, We've been studying and going through exploring God's word uh, with Brother Haskins and Brother Calhoun yesterday, and we were and there's just something that, man, you start going through the book of Genesis, the juices start flowing. Man, I just love it. And one of the things yesterday that we started to get into just a little bit, it is the power of mercy. And where did it come from? The power of mercy came from two things. In Adam and Eve in the garden, the Bible said, if you sin, if you eat of the tree, you'll die, right? You shall surely die. So all of a sudden, they, 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 they committed sin. But the, the, their life was going to start ending. Their life was, they were going to, not going to live forever. Now they were going to die. But there was something that took place for the very first time in Scripture. They find the righteousness of God and the law of God that says, if you eat of this, you'll die. But then all of a sudden, because God loved them so much that he created them in his own image, his love shone down upon them. And because of the righteousness of God, said that you got to die, but the love of God says, I want to keep them because they're mine and they're my image. Those two things collided. And when those two things collided, mercy was produced. Because the righteousness of God says this, but the love of God says this. And on Calvary's cross, ladies and gentlemen, guess what was produced? Mercy was produced. Romans 6 or Romans 3.23 says what? For the wages of sin is what? death but the gift of God through the power of the cross extended mercy to me that I may have life and in this life the Bible says in other verses have it more abundantly excuse me yeah Romans 6 23 so 2 Corinthians 5 21 for he hath made him to be a sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him Somebody say amen. Acts chapter number 3, verse number 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Now listen to me. You are not converted when you get the Holy Ghost. That's not your conversion. The Bible even says that you're not converted when you're baptized. If you're baptized into Christ... The Holy Ghost fills you. You are baptized with the Holy Ghost. Conversion happens when you make a statement saying, God, forgive me. I repent of my sins. Because then you convert your mind. You convert your heart from the things of the world to things of God. The Bible says, repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So repent, get converted. Somebody say, I got to be converted. You don't need a convertible. You need a converted. <laughs> no, you need converted. <laughs> so that your sins may be blotted out. God, forgive me. God, help me. 
when the times of refreshing shall come. So I need to have my heart converted, and I need to have repentance in my heart, so when the presence of God does come, then I can feel the refreshing and have the refreshing in the presence of the Lord. Let's go to another verse, Ephesians chapter number 2. Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 8 and 9. If I'm going too fast, forgive me. I'll try to slow down. Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not, not of yourselves. It is the what? What is it again? It's the gift of God. For by grace you are saved through faith. That doesn't mean I can do anything I want to do because I have the grace of God. No. The grace of God, I've said this a thousand times, and if you don't have it now, I'm going to say it again. The grace of God is a gift to you to complete the will of God, not the will of the flesh. Do I have an amen? The grace of God is for you to complete the will of God, not to continue in, in, continue in sin. The Bible says, Paul says, should I continue in sin? For God forbid. We don't want to continue in sin. It says, and here's it, here it is, Ephesians 2 and 8, 9. Let's go to 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. I am not saved by myself, or I would boast about it, right? Uh, my works, would, I'm not saved by cleaning the bathrooms. I'm not saved by even teaching the word of God. I'm saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, verses 27 and 28. And then here we go. We're going to make a circle all the way around to get right back into our book top topic. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, 28. Now ye are the what? Body of Christ. And members in particular. And God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondary prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, um, uh, governments, diversity, and diversities of tongues. You say, now what, what are we talking about here? I hope you notice it, and I hope you see it. You received a gift from God. When you were converted, when God saved you, when you were filled with the power of the Holy Ghost, when you were baptized into Christ, that is a gift. Look to your neighbor and say, that was a gift. Boys, that's a gift from God. The body of Christ is a gift from God. You received a gift, a free gift of eternal salvation. Isn't that amazing? That gift includes that eternal salvation. It includes forgiveness of sins by Christ's death on the cross. Are you thankful for that? It includes adoption by God, our Heavenly Father. It includes the infilling are they being infilled and indwelling of the Holy Spirit? I'm thankful for that. And it includes becoming a, bar, a part of the body of Christ. That's a gift. Now you are a part of the body of Christ. That is a gift to you. God said, I have died on the cross. I've forgiven your sins. I've given you grace. I've given you mercy. And I've given you my body, which is the church. It is the body of Christ. So that's right. Membership into the body. The church. It is a gift from God. Amen. The people that you are sitting next to as we are of a local body of believers, they are a gift from God. This church assembly, this is a gift from God. You are a gift of God. Us assembling together as a local body of believers, we are a gift. Of, we, this is a gift from God. Membership into the body of Christ, the church, is a gift from God. It is not a legalistic obligation. It's not a country club full, filled with perks. It's not a license for entitlements. 
Amen? It's not a license for entitlements. I'm not pausing there to say that we have a bunch of people that are entitled. That's not what I'm saying. But when you, I want you to notice that spirit, if it starts to get in you, or get that, if, it get, if you have that spirit inside of you, or you somebody comes into the body of Christ and they have a feeling like a license of entitlement, you, we need to pray for them. It is a gift from God, not an entitlement. The entitlement is if you sin, you'll, be, you'll die for the wages of sin is death, right? The gift is eternal life. The gift is forgiveness of your sins. The gift is the body of Christ. It is a gift from God, a gift that we should treasure with great joy and anticipation. So when we come into the house of God, I'm going to the greatest gift that God has left mankind. He's given me the church to, to worship with. He's given me the church to go to, to love, to, to, to show out the things of God. We should treasure this great gift with great joy and anticipation. Now, this book talks about something else that I think needs to be talked about because it's so true. We're going to talk about the universal church versus the local church. Some argue that the body of Christ refers to the universal church, meaning all believers everywhere for all ages. I'm just a part of the universal body of Christ. How many's ever heard that somebody say that? That I'm just a part of the kingdom of God. I'm and and I am just a I, I, I'm just a member because we're all members in this global thing together. Um, I'm just part of this universal church, and in part, you would be right. But how many know that we are we are a part of a global, perhaps eternal, and generational move of the Holy Ghost? We're all members together in one kingdom, but we have to also understand that in part that is right, but the universal church and the local church are not mutually exclusive. So to the contrary, the, the majority, get this, the majority of the New Testament books are written about and to the local church. Everybody say the local church. The local church. The, 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 the New Testament is, is written to and about the local church. The book of Acts provides a historical narrative of, of the Spirit's work in 19 plus churches. It's probably around 22, 23, 24 maybe churches in the book of Acts that, that is written for those churches. It was also written for everybody, right? But it was also written for the local, to the local church. Because every church and local church, every body has a specific things that they struggle with. Certain appetites that are in that area or, or things that that pastor may struggle with within that community that he's fighting against. So the book of Acts provides a historical narrative of the Spirit's work in 19 plus churches. And nine books in the New Testament were written to local churches. Paul wrote four books to individuals to specific churches. And if you read the book of Revelation all, at all, you'll find the book of Revelation writes and talks about letters to seven churches. Yes, they were also written for all of us to understand, but they were specifically written to those churches and about those churches. So you can't just belong to a collective universal church, and, but you need a local body of believers. Somebody say amen. So what's the point? It's a very lame and valid or invalid excuse to say you will limit your involvement just to the universal church. I'll just go where God wants me to go. I'll just join online to this church over here in California and join online to this church in North Carolina. And I'll give to this cause because I saw this. And I will go here and, and all of a sudden you're just being pulled to and fro throughout this universal church. The Bible is very clear that we are, we are to connect to a specific church in a specific context. And if I can say this, I said this to Brother Arnold today, and when I was, we were talking about this, this particular chapter, the Bible even says that your giving should be to the local church. That's what it says. The Bible says, and this is where people get caught up in the universal church. Well, I, because the Bible says you've got to give 
to the body and where you receive your bread. You receive the word. Well, pastor, I, I watch a lot of people. And I just go around to churches and church and all this. And it, but I just give when God tells me to give. Well, I'm going to tell you what God tells you to give. It's right in his word. It tells you to give to the local church where you get your, your word and where your shepherd is because you need a shepherd. And you also need accountability. You also need that connection. You need to give to that local body of believers. So the Bible is clear in many, many uh, places uh, that we are to connect to a specific church in a specific context. So we've got to understand this gift. It is a gift, a gift that should be treasured and not taken for granted or considered lightly when we talk about the body of Christ. We should be thankful for the local body. Somebody say amen. You need to be thankful. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. I don't know about you, but when you get a gift from somebody, whether it be Christmas time or or whatever it is, and you get a gift that you've been wanting, and it's the best gift. What what was the first thing you do when you receive a gift? You want to get up out of your recliner. You want to get up out of your chair, and you want to go shake the hand or hug that person and say, thank you. This was the ideal perfect thing. Let me give you a hug. Let me say thank you. Let me, can I return the favor? Can I do, what can I do for you because you got this for me? The Bible shows and tells us that when we get this treasured gift from God, it out of the abundance of the greatest gift that you have given, the natural response would be, I got to give something back in return. God, you've given me this great gift. What can I do for you? What can I do for your kingdom? You've given so much for me. God, you gave all, you died on the cross for me. What can I do to repay? What can I do? So we will receive a gift with true appreciation. We naturally want to respond to the give or to the gift. We, we therefore see service to God as natural outflow of joy of our salvation and a consequent joy of our church membership. It is a privilege to serve the king in the local body of Christ. Everybody say it's a privilege. It is a privilege. I, I can't, I, I, I can't, uh, I have a hard time, uh, and I'm, I know I'm the pastor, so, you know, get over it. I'm the pastor. It's, it's natural for me to want to give. I, I, I want to give more financially to the kingdom. I want to give more of my time to the kingdom. I, I want to I be around the people of God. I want to bless the kingdom of God. God, help us not to be begrudgingly. Amen. I don't give to the Lord out of my finances because I'm obligated to do it. I don't know about you, but I've been giving to the Lord since I was 15 years of age. And I have never stopped paying my tithes and giving to the Lord. And I do my best to be here and go to work days and, and be a part of all different things through, through, uh, um, uh, throughout my life and serving the kingdom because I love the body of Christ. I love the kingdom of God. And yes, sometimes it's filled with sacrifice. Yes, sometimes it's filled with your scratch your head. What were we doing when we did that? <laughs> yeah, there are things that sometimes cause us to, to stress about. But really, in the full scope of things, it is a joy and a privilege to serve the kingdom of God. Our natural outflow, when God gave us salvation, the natural outflow should be, Thank you, Jesus. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. How can I be a part of this? How can I advance your kingdom? How can I be a part of the things that you're talking about? Because that would be the natural thing of, you know, other than the sweater I got from my grandma when I was 14, I did not want to say thank you because I wanted a basketball. <laughs> but when God gives you eternity with him, and when God gives you the gift of streets of gold, walls of jasper, and he gives you an eternal joy he puts in, his, in your spirit, when he fills you with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, ladies and gentlemen, and he washes your sins away, it is not a, it is not a heaviness that, wants, that gets me to want to be involved in the kingdom. It's a spirit of thanksgiving. It's a spirit of joy unto the Lord. 
because the body of Christ is a gift to us. You'll say, Pastor, but there's people there. It doesn't look like a gift when there's a bunch of people there. <laughs> and they don't agree with everything, and I don't like everything. And, but guess what? There are things in the Word of God that you probably struggle with. There are things in the Word of God, and the Word of God teaches us a certain principles, and we, we fight against those principles. And our flesh, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak when it comes to the things of God. The body of Christ sometimes is, is we learn from each other when we're in the body of Christ. We, we grow as people in the body of Christ. We learn to love one another in spite of our differences. So a healthy church membership means you find joy in being last, according to Matthew 20. And instead of seeking your own way and being first, let's look at it. Matthew 20, verses 26 through 28. Matthew 20, 26 through 28. Jesus was talking to the disciples. And man, did Jesus kind of lay it out. He says, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Somebody say amen. So do you get the picture of what this is? Church membership, again, is a gift. We respond to gifts with gratitude. And the one key way to express our gratitude is to serve like Jesus did and like he told us to. In other words, it's okay to be last. It's okay to think that uh, I, don't, I don't need to be first. I don't need to be at the, I don't need to be behind the pulpit. I don't need all the glory. I don't need all this. And, and some of us desire so much to be last, so it's false humility. <laughs> oh, pastor, it's just, you know, it's not me. It's, but it's, it can be false humility. But in reality, they we're looking for the attention. <laughs> we just want to be last. So there's a lot of complex things that gets into our psyche. Churches would be a lot healthier and a lot different if members decided to serve and to be last. Let me say that again. Churches would be a lot different if we all decided to serve with joy and decided being last is just fine. Because you, the Bible says to prefer your brother before yourself. No, you, it, go ahead, brother. Go ahead, sister. God bless you. We lift one, one another up. We, 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 we are to encourage one another. To be there for one another. And guess what? This kind of spiritual aptitude or attitude when it comes to looking at the body of Christ, having a biblical perspective of the gift, noticing these scriptures, getting into and understanding the local body of Christ and how we can be an impact to those things and understanding what a great gift this is. And, and guess what? It doesn't start with just everybody jumping on board. It starts with you and your home and your attitude and the way you come. The Bible teaches us, and many people may not know this, that it is not the pastor's or the priest's responsibility to bring the anointing to the local body. You know who's supposed to bring the anointing when we gather together? You. You are. There's nothing more freeing as a pastor and as a leader in a church that people bring the anointing with them. And then when I begin to speak and I begin to preach and I begin to minister or the praise team begins to get up here and sing, because the anointing is already here in the body, it releases those who are trying to lead. This is one of the reasons why Moses blessed Asher with one of the blessings. He says, I bless you with the anointing. And I bless you with the oil so much that you will wade in it. That you will walk in it. 
Why? Because he knew the generations beyond Asher needed the anointing as well. Let you walk in abundance. Guess what? When you come into the house of the Lord and you're waiting in the anointing of the Lord and God is moving upon you, you are changing the next generation. You're changing the atmosphere that is around you and you are releasing the Holy Ghost and his word into your life. Church membership, it's a gift. It's a gift, and it can start with us, and it can start with you. Maybe it already has. I do not come to church looking to be served. I come to church, oh, bless the Lord, and praise be unto his name. I come to bless somebody. I came to, came to be a blessing to somebody. If I bring the anointing with me. I'm not bringing my attitude. It's washed in the presence of God. God has truly furnished me with his good gifts. And when God truly furnishes us with the gift of his presence and the gift of his power, when I begin to move in the body of Christ, everything is set in order. Everything is done with joy and peace and the Holy Ghost. Let's stand together. I don't have a book with me. Who's got one of those I am a church member books if I can borrow? Sister. Surely, thank you. We're going to look at the sixth and final pledge. As a church member, I forgot to type that in my notes. If uh, you are a member of our church and you do not have this book, we have to, we've, we're currently, I think, out of them, and uh, we'll order some more. The Bible says, or the, the, the book says, not the Bible, but the book. The sixth pledge, it says, I am a church member. This membership is a gift. When I received the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, I became a part of the body of Christ. I soon thereafter identified, as a, identified with a local body and was baptized. And now I am humbled and honored to serve and to love others in the church or in our church. I pray that I will never take my membership for granted. Somebody say amen. But see it as a gift and an opportunity to serve others and to be a part of something so much greater than any one person or member. This is bigger than us. Amen. This is bigger than us. It is bigger than any one person. But it's not bigger than the one who created it. Jesus Christ. Let's raise our hands and love the Lord and thank him for this precious gift, the gift of the body of Christ. Lord, we love you. I thank you, Lord, that you are our sovereign king, that you are our sovereign ruler. And, Lord, you are the Lord of this church. God, we are a part of your body. And, God, when you went to the cross, you died upon that cross and you gave of yourself. You gave of yourself for, uh, for our sins. Hallelujah. When we even knew no sin, you died for us. When we were not yet even thought of, God, you died for us. You died once for everybody. It doesn't matter what the background. It does not matter where people come from. It doesn't matter how old they are or how young they are. You died once for all of us. And, God, we give you thanks. And, and God, when we gather together as a body of believers, let us not take one another for granted. Let us not take this church for granted. But, God, help us to serve you, not with our own ideas, not with our own visions, not with our own uh, appetites. But, Lord, let us be mindful, God. Let us not put restrictions on the body. Let us not put restrictions Lord on the membership of this church but God we give you glory we give you honor we give you thanks for providing a place that we can come to and be safe a place that we can come to and be healed a place that we can come to from different dynamics from different places and come together as one body in your name today Jesus we thank you Lord and we understand this gift that should be treasured we under God understand, we understand God that we just should not consider this a, 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 a burden, but we need to consider it, God, as a gift from your presence and a gift from you tonight. So, Lord, we thank you. 
We praise you for this body of believers. I thank you, God, for bringing everybody out tonight. I thank you, Lord, and I bless everyone that is online tonight. Let them feel the power of the Holy Ghost. Let them feel, God, that they are missed tonight. Let them feel, God, that there is a body of believers here tonight that misses when others are not here. Let them feel, God, that anointing, Lord, from the fellow believers. Let, the, let us feel the love for one another. Let us strive to learn from one another. Let us strive to pray for one another. And God is like we have been doing so far this year. Let us, God, bless one another with your word and with your power. We thank you and we praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. And somebody say amen. Come on, let it be so in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. So let's treasure this gift. And the people next to you is a gift from God. Amen. And serving in the kingdom is a gift. So I want you to bless somebody tonight. Shake somebody's hand. Amen. So good to see Sister Sharon again tonight. Amen. Greet her in the name of Jesus. Amen. So God bless you. Grow, go this week. Invite somebody to the house of the Lord Sunday. Amen. Amen. Let's have revival this Sunday. God bless you in Jesus' name.